It surrounds our home in space. It's as essential as food or water, but totally invisible. Without it, we would die in minutes. Explore how we depend on oxygen. The breath of life. Next on Body Atlas. it reacts within our bodies to produce heat and energy. Blood carries this life-giving gas to each of the 60 trillion cells in our bodies. It picks up a new supply of oxygen from the lungs with every breath. We breathe sufficient oxygen without thinking, but trained lungs can help us become champions. John Fitzgerald is a champion, a world-class swimmer. The timing and control of his breathing are essential to his performance in the water. Years of training have put his body in top form. His muscle cells will need many times their normal supply of oxygen if John is to successfully compete in a 1500 meter crawl against the clock. Lungs are a miracle of evolution designed to put the maximum amount of oxygen into our blood. They fill 90% of the chest. Millions of branching air passages make the lungs light and spongy. They weigh only two and a half pounds. The walls of these myriad tubes spread flat would be 50 times larger than our skin and would cover an area the size of a tennis court. Blood vessels line the lungs and absorb oxygen from the air. All life began in the oceans. Oxygen dissolved in water allows fish to breathe through their gills. Air contains 50 times more oxygen than water and our lungs have evolved to take advantage of this plentiful supply. We all experience part of this evolution at birth when we leave the watery confines of our mother's womb. After he struggled for his first few breaths, this little baby boy will breathe another 400 million times during his life. When we breathe in, muscles between the ribs pull the rib cage up. A dome-shaped muscle below the lungs, the diaphragm, moves down. Both actions expand the lungs. It's a superbly reliable machine. When we breathe out, we simply let the muscles relax. And air is automatically expelled from the lungs. The delicate interior of our lungs is immensely vulnerable to damage. Every breath we take is a potential threat. During just one day in a city, you may breathe in over a trillion microscopic particles of dirt and pollution. But the body has built-in defenses. The journey of each lung full of air starts here in the nose. Hairs provide the first line of defense by trapping pollen and larger dirt.
higher up, the inside of the nose is coated with a moist membrane. Special glands secrete mucus, a sticky liquid which traps dust. A carpet of moving microscopic hairs propels the dirt-laden mucus back into our throats. You can either spit it out or swallow it. In cold weather, the hairs become sluggish and excess mucus overflows, giving us the all too familiar runny nose. The passages from mouth and nose join at the back of the throat, just above the larynx or voice box. This is the gateway to the lungs, and it's protected by a tough flap, the epiglottis, that prevents food or water from going down the wrong way. Tense the vocal cords, and we can create sounds and speech that are shaped by the mouth and the bones of the skull. Below the voice box, our windpipe is reinforced with stiff rings of cartilage to keep it permanently open. It's also carpeted with microscopic hairs, acting as a conveyor belt that carries dirt-laden mucus back up to the throat. We give the mucus a little help when we clear our throats or cough. We pump a pint of air in and out of our lungs with each breath, 15 times a minute. During an average lifetime, 13 million cubic feet of air passes through our lungs, enough to fill a football stadium. John has become a top athlete by training hard to make the best use of his body and lungs. Breathing as deeply as possible, he can exhale an impressive 6.5 liters. That's almost 14 pints of lung capacity, a good two pints more than the average person. But his lungs still contain a quart of air that no amount of force can push out. Right, three, two, one, go. To simulate the demands of a real race, John uses a bike in a fitness test designed to take his body to total exhaustion. This carefully monitored test pushes him to his limit and helps him fine tune his performance in the pool. Each breath is forced down through a labyrinth of tubes inside the lung. The air passages split over and over again into ever smaller tubes. In his race, John must pace himself, using each breath as effectively as possible. The efficient transport of air to and from his lungs is critical if he is to win. As John works harder, his consumption of oxygen rises. With each breath, the lungs take in 100 billion trillion molecules of air. Only one-fifth of these are oxygen molecules, the gas that keeps us alive. The rest are mainly nitrogen molecules, an inert gas that flows in and out of our lungs unchanged. Deep in his lungs, the walls of the air passages pulsate with John's heartbeat. The beat increases as his heart vigorously pumps more blood around his body. John's blood is quickly stripped of oxygen as it pounds through every blood vessel in every straining muscle. It's hungry for oxygen when it returns to his lungs. With his body starved of oxygen, John is in pain. Only the conscious instructions from his brain stop him from quitting. This mental control makes the difference between a good athlete 
and a great athlete. The branching maze of air passages ends in tiny tubes, each draped with miniature airbags, the alveoli. We each have 700 million of them. The alveoli mark the end of the road for the inhaled air. This is the inside view of one of the alveoli. Only one hundredth of an inch across, its walls are only a few millionths of an inch thick so oxygen can diffuse straight from the air into the surrounding blood vessels. The blood's role in transporting oxygen is so crucial that the lungs have their own blood supply. One half of the heart is engaged solely in pumping blood to and from the lungs. An intricate network of tiny vessels carries blood depleted of oxygen to the alveoli. This is one of the densest networks of blood vessels anywhere in our bodies. Tiny capillaries are wrapped tightly around each individual air sac. The oxygen in the alveoli crosses to the surrounding blood, where it combines with the chemical hemoglobin, turning our blood a brighter shade of red. Because oxygen doesn't dissolve well, hemoglobin is essential to our survival. Without it, Oxygen couldn't hitch a ride in our blood. Without hemoglobin, our blood would not carry enough oxygen to keep us alive, even when we're resting, let alone during vigorous exercise. Hemoglobin is packaged in special cells, the red blood corpuscles. We each have 30 trillion of these microscopic cells. If they were placed side by side, they would reach halfway to the moon. Racing through John's body, hemoglobin readily donates oxygen to his muscle tissue. Far more fit than the average human, John can move oxygen with high efficiency. His oxygen intake has peaked at 25 times its normal rate. During this fitness test, he's generated enough energy to power a light bulb for 12 hours. He knows just how hard he can push himself. Our bodies can hold only a limited amount of oxygen in our lungs and in our bloodstream. Unless Maria reaches the surface, she'll black out in just two minutes. She needs to use all the precious oxygen she stored in her body. Her brain is the most sensitive to the falling level of oxygen. We can survive without eating or drinking for days, but to live, we must keep breathing. The brain automatically controls breathing. 
consume more oxygen and we breathe more deeply. But it's not the falling oxygen level that signals the lungs to take in more air. The oxygen level drops as hard-working muscles burn it up, producing carbon dioxide. The buildup of this waste gas in the blood tells the brain when our bodies need to breathe more heavily. The carbon dioxide triggers an alarm in the base of the brain, automatically stimulating nerves that control the chest muscles and diaphragm. For a short time, you can consciously override this breathing reflex, but it's impossible to suffocate yourself by holding your breath. If you lose consciousness, the automatic reflex starts up again. It's human nature to try to extend our natural capabilities. A snorkel gives us the ability to breathe underwater. But a snorkel is only useful near the surface. As you dive deeper, the water pressure on the chest increases. It takes more effort to expand the lungs when you breathe in. And the muscles of the chest and diaphragm have only limited power. This scuba diver solves the problem by using a tank of compressed air. It supplies air to her lungs at a pressure that matches the water pressure surrounding her body. With an independent supply like this, she can work at this depth for up to two hours. The deeper a person dives, the less time the air supply will last because of their need to breathe in more air to compensate for the increased water pressure. Divers can work as deep as a thousand feet, where the pressure is almost 500 pounds per square inch. The low pressure at high altitudes causes problems too, due to lack of oxygen. Given enough time, however, we can adapt to living as high as 18,000 feet, where the atmospheric pressure is half that at sea level. Our bodies respond by producing more red blood cells and by growing more capillaries to improve the blood flow to our muscles. Above 30,000 feet, air is far too thin to breathe, so the inside of an aircraft is pressurized. In the unlikely event of a loss of pressure, passengers would suffer from oxygen starvation. In this simulation of a sudden pressure drop, water vapor condenses to a fine mist. Our volunteer in this experiment has been effectively shot up to 24,000 feet in just three seconds. Identifying the numbers on a deck of playing cards tests the volunteer's mental agility. Although she thinks she's feeling fine, and confident, she starts making mistakes after only one minute. Queen of hearts, nine of diamonds. Her brain cells are the first to feel the lack of oxygen. The hemoglobin in her blood is unable to absorb enough oxygen from the thin air and can't stop her brain cells from starving. While our logical higher brain is the first to deteriorate, our primitive lower brain sustains breathing and heartbeat as long as possible. Before our volunteer becomes unconscious, she's given the cure, pure oxygen, as she would on a real flight. In this experiment, the room pressure is lowered to simulate how increasing altitude lowers the boiling point of water. At a pressure equivalent to 60,000 feet above sea level, our blood would boil at body temperature. A pressurized suit with its own air supply is essential for survival at such extreme altitudes, especially if the brain has to work fast and make life or death decisions. 
Space is the ultimate in airlessness. In an almost perfect vacuum, a spacesuit provides all the safety features normally provided by the Earth's atmosphere. A comfortable pressure, abundant oxygen, and chemicals to trap the exhaled carbon dioxide. John has swum almost a mile. Now he goes into his last turn. As he powers his way to the finish, he takes the final few breaths from the ocean of air. He has stripped the air of its oxygen to burn the fuel for his muscles. Oxygen is an essential part of Earth's thin mantle of air, forever nurturing its fragile cargo in a cycle as old as life itself. This is James Burke. I'll show you how historical events can fit together in ways you never imagined as TLC brings you my exploration of the past, Connections 2, next from the Learning Channel. The different tasks 